Hi, I'm Dr. Gil Wilshire. I'm a board certified physician, surgeon, and reproductive endocrinologist. Welcome to my series of podcasts where we discuss medical matters that matter to you. I'll be interviewing top experts in their fields, and we'll also be delving into fascinating backstories from deep within the world of medicine. This is Dr. Wilshire, and welcome to the Dr. Gill Show. This is a show where we talk about medical matters that matter to you. Our guest today is Dr. Marianne Mishevitz. Marianne, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. Marianne is a podiatrist, a DPM, and we're going to talk about feet and foot health today. That's right. We have a lot of ground to cover today. We have a lot of ground (laughs) to cover. I love it. Now, I'm very interested in uh, foot medicine, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why. When I was a child, I was diagnosed with flat feet. I had painful feet, and I was always getting special shoes and whatnot to help me. And then it turns out my best friend, maybe my best friend in the world, um, his name is Lance Malkin. He is a pedorthotist. And in no f- kidding. Yes. And in fact, he does. I think he knows, but I'm going to do a podcast with him regarding shoes and pedorthics, 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 and, yes. and, and orthotic. Orthotics mm-hmm. is a word I'm looking. In fact, I, I wear them almost all the time. My I'm wearing feet. mine right now. Yeah. It's a whole thing. So, you know, foot pain and foot issues came to me early. In medical school, I had another event that was life changing. When you do surgery <clears throat> rotation, as the medical student, you're the retractor. You hold things. I've held the liver for three you hours. Hold a lot of things. Doing yes. a lot of things. Mm-hmm. And when I did my vascular surgery, there was an amputation. And the surgeon is not going to get all sweaty and hot. And they, they, so what is the job of the medical student? Well, there's this thing called a giggly saw. It's this cable with these burrs and teeth on it and these two handles on it. And it was my job in one case to amputate a lower limb to go through the tibia. And they hand me the saw, and it, it goes like this. It, it, it's it's, this mm-hmm. it's a jigsaw. Yep. It's mm-hmm. a jigsaw. And I remember doing that for five. It was a hard job. I worked up the sweat. And I'll never forget them handing off the limb and realizing this person was never going to have their foot again or their lower limb. And when I walked out of that case, every time my right foot hit the ground, I thank God for a foot. And I have, and you know, and it doesn't like I don't think about this every second of the day, but it has shaped my appreciation for my limbs and my feet mm-hmm. in a way that is indelible. It'll it'll never, as long as I have two brain cells, it's going to be part of my memory in my my life. So. Appreciation, appreciation of, of the foot. Um, I is, think is you're right. Deep. Feet are very underappreciated yeah. until they start causing you problems. I remember in residency, um, there was, I don't remember, it was a call situation or something like that, and there was a hand surgeon on, and he said, I don't work on the inferior extremity. And I remember uh, thinking to myself, uh, oh, you wait till the day your foot starts hurting. Not right. that I would wish that on anybody, but I'm like, you know what, there's... You know, feet are important. You could make a case that they're more important. Mm. We all, they, every part plays their role. Every part, but yeah, good, well said. Well said. So what I was hoping, Marianne, to talk about is foot health in general. For the Before we get into all the, the diseases that you're the expert for, I was wondering, could we to- talk about some overarching things we can do to take care of our feet? I'd love to talk about that. I would love to start <laughs> there in the in the general the healthy foot or maintaining uh, the, the the healthy foot. All right. Well, um, and tell me if I'm I'm hitting on the right subject. First of all, there's hygiene, keeping your feet clean and dry. I assume that's an easy one, but then you get to nails, and 
boy, how do you, how does a healthy person take care of their nails to keep them healthy and functional? Well, I mean, all that goes along with hygiene and just kind of paying attention. You know, right. sometimes, again, the foot is underappreciated, and so we're not paying attention to our foot. It's neglected. Um, it's neglected. Um, you know, but the time will come when your nails will get long and they bother you. You want to make sure you're cutting them straight across. Yeah, I keep hearing the- <laughs> that, but when I'm peeling off, I'm the kind of person, when I was a kid, I would bite mm-hmm. my nail. I would get, I could bend and I could actually bite my nails. I always bit them and pull them very, very close, all the way down to the corner. I've heard you got to cut them straight across, but then that leaves that little corner area. Well, it does leave that dirt, corner that area. It gets get dirty and I don't like it. It does, but if there's any sort of curvature to your nail, if you don't catch all of the nail or you go in too far, it can set you up for getting an infection. Sure, yeah, you don't problem. want to go too far. And so where, where so, is just right? right? So th- just right for someone that's trying to do it to themselves is to cut it flush with the skin straight uh, straight across it's a little bit different if somebody else is doing it to you i might contour a nail a little bit but still be Mm -hmm. able to leave an edge it's difficult even for a flexible person to get down there and cut it without having a problem or creating a secondary problem and get close enough to see right exactly you know like i used to i sit or stand at a patient's foot so it's right there right there in my face and so i can see very clearly what's going on it's harder for me to do that to myself and as i'm getting older i'm less flexible i'm right you know trying to hover over a toilet or or do something i'm like did i get it did i not get it right right so can you make any blanket statements about pedicures obviously Mm -hmm. these are these are professional people they're doing it all day yes they're right down there they have the tools and whatnot is getting a pedicure, I've never had one. I know some women get them all the time. Is there anything, a blanket statement you can make? Are, are they generally good or generally harmful? A bad idea, a good idea? Depends on the salon. What do you think? Um, in, I'm not one that goes for pedicures myself. However, there are a lot of reputable professionals that are trained well, and they understand what they can do and what they can't do. Um, and so in general, I don't see, and particularly in the population that I treat now, I don't see a lot of problems coming back. But even when I was in my private practice, I, I didn't see a lot of problems from pedicures. I did see them, if you're diabetic, I would probably stay away from having anyone other than a foot expert work on your, on your feet, either a nail trained nurse or or a podiatrist. Um, and the same thing goes if somebody's got some vascular disease or they can't really feel their feet well. Um, and it's not a knock on those doing pedicures. It's more of just a safety issue. If, if a problem comes up, you know, we can take care of it better. Um, you know, the, um, I think most licensed professionals are probably safe. You know, you want to listen to word of mouth, you know, and think, you know, these people don't you know, do a good job or they don't do a good job, you know, your sure. friends will tell you, you know, all about that. Um, you sure. know, I wouldn't let them cut back any cuticles. That's again, inviting okay. infection, you know, okay. but, but they're not inherently dangerous. But no, They're not inherently dangerous unless you fall into a category with diabetes or you don't have, don't have good circulation or don't have good feeling in your feet. That would be a time to maybe avoid that. Now that you mentioned circulation, obviously a shoe that's way too tight <clears throat> or a woman obviously in these horrible high heels with her up here has got to be painful and whatnot. But do you have any other suggestions for maximizing like the circulation of your foot when it comes to footwear or sandals or something like that? So as far as uh, wearing foot gear and choosing foot gear, you really want to make good choices, reasonable choices most of the time. Okay. And I'll say most of the time because we all have occasions where we're not going to make a good choice. That's just, that's just how life is. You know, if you want to go for a wedding, you know, or an evening out, you may make a choice that's not really great for your feet. And again, unless you fall into that category for a diabetic or, you know, you have known bad circulation, you're not going to have any longstanding damage from one night of a bad choice. typically. However, you know, you do want to make sure that, you know, you have room enough for your feet, a good quarter inch at your toe box, you know, make sure your toe box fits your foot. 
Uh-huh. So if you've got a foot that tends to go very square, you want to choose the square toe box, okay. you know. So if a shoe doesn't hurt, that's a good start. I assume. That's a great start. It shouldn't be an issue of you're going and I have to break this shoe in. It should fit well from the get-go. Um, I would try your shoes on later on in the day when your feet have had an opportunity to puff up as they all do. All do, huh? Right? Everybody's do. Um, also, our shoe size isn't static. It's not something that you keep for the rest of your life. Tell me more. Your shoe size can change like you change, okay? Uh, um, it isn't an issue of growth. With children, you know, they grow and they're their bones mature and you know they may get a longer foot or a wider foot um and that really doesn't stop until gosh you're getting closer to your 20s before really? that growth stops however as life happens your foot size will change if you bear children you know that extra ah. weight and that oxytocin that gets released that relaxes those ah. ligaments to allow a baby to pass through your canal right also st- it doesn't target the pelvis it's everything. it's everywhere so over time your feet will spread as you use your feet and they get more arthritic and the joints don't work very well and the arches drop your shoe size will change so you may start out in your 20s in a nine you know by the time you're 60 you may be in an 11 and that's okay ah, that much difference it can be that much difference weight gain and weight loss can change ah, your shoe size yeah i've gained weight and lost so, weight I, and, yeah, and it will change you. your suit your shoe size you know 10 15 pounds may be a half a size shoe depending yeah. on how the shoe is made and yep. you know what kind of shoe you're using but interesting but it now, matters so you know don't be married to a size be married to what feels good that's great advice now getting more to, to the daily hygiene Obviously, if you're taking a shower every day, you want to soap your feet, you want to dry your feet. Mm-hmm. Now, is there any benefit to uh, rubbing alcohol or something on your on your feet or a blow dryer? I've heard different mm. tricks to get your feet. Because I know if I just towel off my old, my toes are always just a little wet when I'm putting on my you, socks and shoes. You could do a blow dryer. I would use a cool setting. I wouldn't do a hot setting. You don't want to burn yourself. Okay. Um, you know, uh, washcloth between your toes or a towel between your toes can be mm-hmm. helpful to get those kind of so just keep it clean like any clean, other part like of your body any other part of your body you know because those are those sweaty parts also tend to accumulate other organisms we have organisms all over our skin sure our skin's a a good barrier you know to to keep things up but we want to keep it healthy if you're too moist your skin can crack much like if it's too dry it can crack so really Gotcha. Almost, you want to think of your your feet and really yourself as a house plant, not too dry, not too wet. You dry it out too much, you turn brown and shrivelly, right. and things don't work. If you moisten it up too much, they get yellow and goopy and dry off and and die off rather. I love it. What and a so pearl! So treat your <laughs> treat your feet and your body that way too. You're aiming for moist. Nobody likes that word moist, but moist, but, there you but go. that's what you want to be. You want to be moist. Now, is there any role for ultraviolet light sunlight beach sand salt water i always notice my feet feel really good when i come back from a a beach vacation they do all that exfoliation you know and there are exfoliants that you can use you can use things like and we actually recommend them things like alpha hydroxy acids or urea creams and these are these are commercially available. Some of them are prescription strength, you know, so again, that's where you would consult with your podiatrist. Um, Uh, But, you know, there are over-the-counter ingredients, you know, lotions and creams that you can purchase that have these things. Ceramides are good, like in CeraVe, they have ceramides in it. That's good for protecting that barrier. Urea creams, amlactin, the, the lactic acids, they are exfoliants and they will help to get rid of that dry skin and still moisturize the good skin underneath. So that's, that's good to use. Just not between your toes. Between the toes taste too wet. Ah, interesting. Very interesting. So. <clears throat> so Marianne, you, we talked about shoes. Obviously, you want them comfortable, fit your feet. I like living in, uh, uh, I don't want to, there's one particular brand of running shoe that fits my foot. I understand, look, 
some brands use a different size last or a different shape. Different shape it, it, of last, that, yes. That, that's mm -hmm. a real thing. If you, Those some, are real things. Some brands fit me better than others. One in yes. particular, I work because I've been on my feet a long time. I'm a surgeon as well, and, and there's one particular running shoe that suits me very, very well. Now, talk to me about barefoot. Is barefoot inherently more healthy or less healthy or... Tell me about you know some people. I know there were these um, another brand of shoe that had the, the to, has the toes mm -hmm. in them. Yep, they, they were the all the rage for a while, but now they're and kind of barefoot running was the rage for yeah a while, and that kind of goes in and out of vogue. The whole barefoot, not barefoot thing. Um, for barefoot, um, for young children that are learning how to walk. Um, for example, my kids, when they were small, I didn't put them in shoes until they were really walking or where they were using their feet to kind of okay. kind of push up. I kept them barefoot, um, and we did a lot of play, um, kind of barefoot or sock foot. Um, obviously not in a place where their feet would be hurt. Yeah, you not, know, not injured, yeah, you dirty. Know, but if you don't in. have a child that's walking, they don't need to be in a in a shoe. I know they're, they're shoes that are cute and folks want them for, you know, an aesthetic or a look. I didn't do that um, with my children. Um, and, and their muscles, you know, their feet are not developed. And so they, you know, you're using those muscles. They need to grip. They don't need to be gripping yeah. a shoe. They need to be gripping, gripping the ground. Little monkey um, feet. Nothing wrong with that. That's right. But um, for grownups, um, you know, it kind of depends. You know, there's circumstances when barefoot is okay and other circumstances where it's not and it could be dangerous you know so it's not in, it's not like gee when you get home from work you need to take your shoes off or you're on, when you're on vacation you should be barefoot or anything no like i that. do i i do me personally okay say i do come home i we try not to wear the same shoes in the house because it tracks in in dirt but sure. i don't function well without some sort of support so i typically don't go barefoot even at the pool i'm walking in a sandal to the to the edge of the water and then getting in gotcha. um, because my feet won't tolerate that for very long. I'll hurt and I don't want to hurt the things I want to do. Um, but I don't mind getting out of the shoes and letting my feet breathe. Right. You know, I don't keep socks on them all the time. You know, I try to sleep air. barefoot. Yeah, I do. Although, I mean, if your feet are cold and that helps you to sleep, socks <laughs> are fine. Yeah. We do use them. We yeah. do tell patients to wear socks sometimes if we are trying to treat a skin issue. Ah, we were talking okay. about dryness and, right. and cracking earlier. Um, you know, that occlusion, putting a sock on your foot also helps to help that medicine penetrate. And so there's times that we use it. Um, if you have a circulatory diabetic complication, you don't want to do that, you know. Um, if your feet don't hurt and you don't have any of those things and you want to be barefoot in the house, have fun. Have fun. <laughs> That's great. Now, this may be something outside your purview, but I know there's a an argument on, on, on the proper technique of running. There, having been, I was a cross country runner for a while, and I, I know Chris is a runner. There's the kind of roll strike with your heel. Mm -hmm. and the heel roll, strike versus the midfoot or forefoot And then the midfoot strike. ball yeah, rather land on the ball of your foot. Apparently the Incas, these Inca guys ran 100 miles a day through, through, through the Andes Mountains running on the balls of their feet. Probably you get more spring. I think any, it any is an issue of, of I think that it, it is an issue of spring. Um, I don't know that everybody can do all of those things. You know, there's consequences. Um, you know, if you're going to put a lot of load on your forefoot, it's going to, your, your shock absorption is going to be different. Some feet can take it and some of them can't. Right. And so what I would tell somebody is run how it feels natural for you. You know, if you need to find a coach, mm. help find a running okay. coach, somebody that can actually look at your form and look at your mechanics as a whole and say, you know what, I know you want to try this, but this may not be the right thing for you. Well, there you go. That makes sense. We're all built differently. Mm -hmm. For example, I cannot jump. I can run. I used to be able to run forever. Uh, my vertical jump is, I'm just not built that way. I can shop. <laughs> 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 I love it. So something I, I neglected to talk about early on. So you, you mentioned that after your residency, you went to private practice. That's correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what brought an Ohio girl to Missouri? 
you know, when I was thinking about employment, you know, where my future would go, I, I knew it would not stay in Salt Lake City for various reasons. One of the reasons why I went there is because I have family there and I still have family okay. there. And I very much enjoy going back there um, and visiting. Um, but it wasn't the right fit for me. Um, mm. And so I basically thought, what is, my family was back in Ohio, my immediate family, and I thought, what is within a day's drive? Not too and close, not, not too, too close, far. Not too far. What can I drive in a day? And, um, and who has jobs available that will pay me what I want and be the kind of practice that I would fit into? I had a good idea of what I, how I wanted to practice. So, um, and so I set out a radius and started back then. <laughs> you were applying in the back of trade magazines. They right, the, an actual the practices, ad. Yeah. And it was an ad in right. the magazines of, you know, this practice is looking in this area, in this state. And so I started sending out resumes. And so um, I looked at um, Buffalo, New York, mm -hmm. um, Erie, Pennsylvania, um, Grand Rapids, Michigan, um, Louisiana, and, and Missouri. I, answer, I, I answered an ad for Columbia, Missouri, and I'm like, I don't even know where that is. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. And it ended up being a fantastic place. And it ended yeah. up being a great place to be. And I thought, you know what? I'm young. It's a year. Oh, you, you can know? do anything for I a year. I can do anything yeah. for a year and, yeah. and see how much I like it. And I got here and I liked the practice. I liked the people that were working there. I liked the area. I <laughs> I love you. Show, show, show everybody your, your water bottle. Hold it up to this camera right here. What does that say? It says... No coast, no problem. Midwest, USA. The Midwest. <laughs> and then I have Missouri. Columbia. It's not that bad. It's not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for showing me that. And now I believe you've settled into a position at the VA hospital here, have, Truman. Yeah. Is it Truman Hospital, Truman Medical Center? What is it's it called? It's Harry S. Truman VA Medical Center. Are you, are you happy there? I am happy there. Are you taking care of our veterans? I love to keep our veterans walking. Bless your heart. Bless your heart. That, that is a higher calling. And, uh, uh, you know, just personally, I think vets deserve the, the best of everything. And, and I'm so glad you're doing that. For well, them. I'll tell you what. This yeah. is, I don't know how many people are aware of this, but the VA trains 70% of medical graduates in the U.S. So of all, of of all, all, all the gra of all types, 70% of medical professionals that have, that are working right now did some of their training or all of their training at a VA hospital. So not only have these, you know, soldiers signed up to forfeit their lives really. Right. And, and have paid dearly with their minds or their bodies or both. Right. Um, and their families have also, not only have they done that, but then they come back and allow us to learn from them. I mean, it's a, it's a privilege to take care of them. It That's really fantastic. is. And they are, they are extremely grateful. Mm. population mm -hmm. you know for as many complaints as we hear here and there we don't really hear them about our hospital and there are some things to complain about we can always do better right you know but um in general my veterans are really happy to be there and they're a joy to treat that's you know? wonderful they really are and i and i did it, it there was a it, it was a point in my life where i had to make some decisions you know professionally and and time wise to spend time with my family and this was going to be a better fit i had worked at the va part-time the entire time while i was in private practice um and so it when a position came up it was just a it natural, was a natural thing a i natural thing. i do have some skin in the game though i do have a son on active duty and so uh, it's more than just feeling like i want to give back to the veterans you know i have one so <laughs> good for you good for you that's a nice segue into from moving from healthy feet and hygiene to the various problems for mm -hmm. which you need a, a, a doctor. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I think you, you were thoughtful enough to prepare some, uh, uh, some notes as I'd, I'd asked you, I'd asked you what are the top 10 things or mm -hmm. things that you treat. So maybe we could mm -hmm. start with, with the, mm -hmm. the common conditions that you treat and we could learn, learn about them. Yeah start with kind of the common things in general and then maybe we can talk about my the unique things to the population that i treat right perfect now. perfect so because they do have applications in non-veteran worlds also sure. yeah 
So, top 10 diagnosis for podiatry. Uh -huh. They're not really ranked. This isn't going to be like David Letterman. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, quick list here. So, nail fungus and associated nail problems. This brings a lot of people in. That and plantar uh -huh. fasciitis. Those are my top two. I mean, if you were, if I were to have a scheduled day of 30, 35 in private practice, that would be 60 to 70%. So let's talk about nails and nail fungus. I mean, you see the ads on TV. I mean, if there's all these ads on TV, it's got to be a big problem. Mm -hmm. I won't say who I know in my life, but I, <laughs> I, I, I know one or two people who have this issue. It is a very, very common issue. So what very is common. the, so how does, let, let me guess. You know you've got a, 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 a nail fungus problem when your nails start to turn brown, right? Maybe. And do they peel up a little bit? So I have, well, what are the signs uh, the signs to somebody to tell them, hey, I might have a, a nail fungus? Well, there will be, the nail will change. There will okay. be discoloration. So, and, you know, depending on how much pigment in your skin, that coloration may look different. Depending on the organism, that pigmentation may look different. So, so black folks might have different colors than white folks, and a, a pale, yeah. uh -huh. a pale yeah. blonde might have different colors. It, it may look, di yeah, it may look different. We have to pay attention to, to skin tone. Interesting. You do. Um, it may be white. It could be brown. It could be black. It could be green. It could be yellow. And a combination of any of those things. Um, and that's to say, you you said, how do you know by looking at it? You don't. You can't tell that it's fungus or not without taking a sample of it and doing some testing on it. So what would you do? Take a, would you scrape underneath it or to culture? How, how would you to, get a sample? Co well, culture is one way of doing it. That's what, that's my kind of method of choice because it also gives you an organism. When you do uh -huh. a culture on something, you know, you get a report back from a laboratory. It doesn't just tell you that this organism is present. They tell you what it is. And when you uh -huh. know what it is, sometimes that might change how you approach it, you know, or you have a better way of knowing, you know, this, this so particular organism may not respond to treatment. And so there's not just one fungus. It's no. a world of fungi. It's a world of fungi and molds and yeasts and things. Oh my goodness. I never knew that. And sometimes that. it's not any of those things. Sometimes it's that the nail was damaged and that's just uh, it. You know, you're, and, and, and you need a professional to be able to assess, to assess this. that right so wow. you know there's a lot of you know kind of self-assessment and and there's value in that but you know sometimes folks assume that it's a fungus or you know they think they have a fungus and they think they treated it well maybe it was just nail damage or you know maybe they didn't have a fungus or maybe the fungus is still there it's just not as pronounced as it was so all right so let's say a, a person a vet or, or any person said gee but there's something different about my nail they go to a podiatrist such as you. What, what are you, how are you going to diet? What are you going to do when well, you see this person? After, what can they expect? What can they expect? Well, we're going to take a look, first of all. And okay. so, you know, like I said, I can't diagnose fungus, but I can make a good guess of this probably needs to be cultured. And so back to your other question, you could do a culture, you can do a stain on that, that well, and tissue. And look at it under the microscope And look at it right under the microscope. I don't because that's not my bag. I will send it to a lab and, and do that. And we have a lab in house. But, you know, some of our dermatology colleagues, they will go ahead and take the sample and stain themselves. Uh, st not themselves, but right, <laughs> stain right, the right. sample themselves. Right, right, right. right. Um, you know, um, I don't have time to do that. <laughs> so I will, I will take a sample. And so it's a near painless procedure. Okay. So we take a piece of the nail and you need to get what's underneath the nail. Out of yeah. there. So you take, you kind of take the top off a little bit, make sure you've got some of the gunk. debris. Is debris, what that's nice. Debris it's better than gunk. Yeah. Subungual debris is how it Love will be it. documented. Subungual debris. Subungual debris. Sub meaning under. The ungual, word of the day is ungual, subungual. Subungual. <laughs> <laughs> ungual meaning nail. And so you want some of that stuff that's, that's growing underneath there. And that's the stuff that's rich in organisms and that will. So you get a result in about a week or two, or what does that take? Um, our lab typically it's four weeks ah. um, because they remember they're doing a, a culture on it, so they have to once they get enough growth, um, they will uh, they will do tests to that to kind of try to identify the organism, 
as an aside, you asked me uh -huh. earlier yeah. about how I got involved yeah. in going to podiatry and that yeah. podiatrist that I shadowed right. um, back in Alliance, Ohio. Um, one of the things that I did for my senior culminating research project was I collected samples of toenails from the office and I tried to grow them myself in the lab. And you would think that that would be a simple thing and actually it is not. Fungus is extraordinarily fussy. Mm. It's a very fussy organism. It is ever present and difficult to kill off, but to flourish needs a very, very specific environment. Specific environment. And underneath your toes, in your skin folds, yeah. those dark, warm, damp places that aren't mm. quite body temperature, like core temperature, right. like paradise for it. And it will yeah. flourish. It's a biofilm. It's a lab, got, yeah. yeah. A lab, a lab is, environment is difficult to create that. So, so it can take a little while to get results. So it takes a little while to get, and it tends to be slow growing. So you could have a fungal infection that may start, and it may be months before you're aware that you had it, which is why folks, you know, a female patient or, you know, anyone that wants to wear polish, you know, they may go and get their nails painted uh, somewhere and not take, let it just wear off. And then suddenly they look down and they're like, holy crap, there's a life. weird brown streak under my nail. What happened? You know, and this may have happened, you know, weeks, months before, but it's so slow growing that you don't, you don't gotcha. really see it. No, that's not, a, you're reminding me of medical school. I remember talking about to, culturing tuberculosis. <laughs> We, take three we did four, not do that in my right, school. Right, right, right. <laughs> the days of old, we had uh, slant augers and stuff. It would take like three or four months mm -hmm. to grow a tuberculosis. Yeah, because it's a, yeah, cause it's it's a least, spore. It's yeah. a spore and it, it, it's not in its normal place. So, oh, yeah. so let's say you see this person, you diagnose them with this mm -hmm. fungus. Let's say it's a run of, what would be the most common organism? What's a run of the mill, everyday garden variety fungus? Trichophyton rubrum. Trichophyton rubrum. Mm -hmm. So it's and a epidermal red... flocosum. Epidermal flocosum. Epidermosum. I so, might be mispronouncing that one. <laughs> I love it. It's good. I love it. I can these... read it and see it. <laughs> Latin tongue twister. So you get one of these organisms. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to treat this person? So, well, it depends on what they want to do. Okay. And I'll start by saying that. I want a cure, doctor. There is a cure. We'll get to that. Ah. Just a moment. So tell me, what are my options, So doctor? options. Options to treat nail fungus. One option is benign neglect. You're probably not going to die of a nail fungus. And it's really slow growing. With good hygiene, you can keep it contained. Okay. So will, some, will it spread to all the toes? Is it usually one toe or is it a few of them? It can be. Sometimes it's one nail. Sometimes it can spread over time to other nails. Okay. It just kind of depends. It may be on one foot, one hand, or one digit. It may be on all of them and depends on the environment that the foot is in. Um, you can try topical medications. There are topical ma medications available for this. Um, there are prescription versions and they are over-the-counter versions. The prescription has got to be better, right? Not necessarily, no. Ah. You still have to get past this. That's the nail no, itself. So how do you get it under there? Well, it's difficult to get it under there. So a lot of times you're painting kind of the edge of the nail and uh, around the nail and you're doing it twice daily for a year because oh that's my how goodness. long it takes to push out that big toenail from here to here. So uh, it's a long process. Now, are there any oral medicines you can take there that are treat oral from the inside? that do treat from the inside. The efficacy is not that much better after using them really? for 20 some years. You do have, I mean, there are patients that get better using topicals. There are patients that get better doing fungal or oral antifungals, okay. um, but it's not great or consistent and it doesn't keep you from getting it again. And those medications come with consequences. The oral ones do. So well, I know we give them for, for genital yeast infections mm -hmm. and whatnot. It's the liver. It's and the it's, liver. It's not yeah. Trivial. So it's the liver and it's also the, me the medication interactions with other potential medications. Right. So it's not something we typically put you on and you go on it every year. You take, it's a pill a day usually for several months. Um, and then it still takes a year to push out that nail because it doesn't make that disappear. You have to grow an all new nail. 
Wow. So it's a chronic annoyance. So, and it can be, and it's thing. very easy to reinfect. So it is, it is a very frustrating problem, you know, because, you know, even with just aesthetically, it can be a frustrating problem. Sure. Um, but also it changes the nail. So sometimes it makes it difficult to cut and manage, you know, and so then that may require some professional care. You that asked was... about a cure. Yes. There is a hundred percent cure. And that's to kill off the toenail so it doesn't grow back. And it's 100% cure because there's no nail to infect. So you said kill it off. Do you mean surgically remove it? You can, you can, there, to remove it, yes, so it doesn't grow back. And you can, it is a surgery. It's a, it's a typically an in-office procedure, although we do have patients that choose to um, get some uh, sedation for that. So you'll... You Obviously, put local anesthesia. Yes. You'll inject yeah. all those. We don't. We don't believe in brutality. We believe in making things as so painless as possible. You can numb up the area, so you're going to feel what mm -hmm. we call we call the mosquito bites mm -hmm. of the anesthetic going in, and then you can surgically remove the nails, and problem solved. That will cure your fungus because there's no nail to grow back. So you can make it so the bed or whatever makes. Mm -hmm. I still don't understand how nails grow. It's a big mystery to me. <laughs> I still don't understand how you can. A nail, you can bleed under there and then you can hit it and then it peels off and there's a new nail mm -hmm. under there. Right? It's that it's matrix event. hiding under that. So you can well, get the matrix. Right. You can get, you get all, all that. You have to get all that matrix out. It's a germinal matrix, right? That's correct. Yep. I remember that much. That's right. You can get the germinal matrix. So you're then without nails. Mm -hmm. Now, does that compromise walking or no. are there any real consequences of that? What I can tell you is that Everyone who's gotten to a point where they're ready to kill off their toenails, they are happy to not have them anymore. Yeah, no I'm one sure has they... gone back and has said, I wish I would have let that nail grow. No. I'm sure most Because a lot of times it's, it's pain. I mean, you know, it's pain uh, and not having to deal with it. You know, you don't have to deal with it. You don't have to look at it, you know, anymore. I can just go about my business and forget about it. I have a thick nail I'm trying to trim. You know, this is just interfering with my wearing my shoes and creating problems. And so I'm. Pure. Yes. Now yeah. we don't do it like we used to do it, you know, back 50 years ago, 100 years ago to, we didn't take out matrices. We didn't do matrixectomies. We did a distal symes amputation. What is a distal symes amputation? Please? It is much like declawing a cat. What they do is ah. you take off the digit at the first joint. Oh. So that could affect your walking a little bit. So that could affect your walking. I did have a patient, this is 20 years ago, and, and the patient was elderly at the time. And, you know, I had asked because that patient came in for some problem and they had had, I mean, clearly they had a distal symes amputation. I asked, you know, what, what that was about. And they're like, oh, she, the patient was small, young went in for an ingrown toenail surgery, came out missing a digit, didn't know about it, was mad for the next 80 years. <laughs> just one. They just did it to the, one yeah, time. Well, yeah. They didn't do all they 10. They didn't do all 10 of them, but that's how they treated the ingrown nail was to do a distal signs. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. We don't do that anymore. Not for that. We do it in some cases, but not for uh, typically not for an ingrown. So there is hope. If one has this, there are topical things you can paint on. If mm -hmm. you're and if you're you know, fastidious, and you do it twice a day, and, mm -hmm. and maybe take some pills. There, there is potential cure. Yeah, it's one of those things you just kind of you know take you know with each patient, their risk benefit um, analysis will be different. You know what makes sense for them. You know, be it cost, time, you know, patients, pain. You gotcha. know how they want to do it so there's not really a i tell them i said there's not really a right or a wrong it's you know how much you want to do with it what i can tell you is this will be your success rates for x y and z choices and they can choose and they can choose gotcha now did you say the second most common thing you treat did you say heel spur i said plantar fasciitis you said plantar yes. fasciitis i was thinking in that direction what is well how do you know you have plantar fasciitis what is it Oh, everybody knows. They Google it. Or their well, friend has it. Ah, <laughs> well, it's well, very common. What Lots do of people you have it. say? What do I say? Did, did somebody have pain? Did they come to you and say, gee, doc, the, I have this pain in the middle of my arch? Or, they mean, will, well, they'll come in, you know, typically it will say heel pain. 
on, you know, if, if I'm looking at a reason for why the patient came in is usually heel pain. And some of them will come in saying that they think they have plantar fasciitis because a they friend Googled. had it or they sure. Googled it or what, or what have you. And it is a, it's a common, common thing. 45% of people that are seeking out a musculoskeletal doctor are coming in for plantar fasciitis. 45%. Mm -hmm. It's very common and it can be debilitating, wow. you know, and it's insidious. Does it, does it hurt? So when a person is, you know, good, is it when the heel strikes or is it when they're standing or what makes it worse? I mean, how did it? Typically, it's pain with first steps after rest. And that's how it starts. They think they got a stone uh, bruise. It's, it, it doesn't come on like you think, oh, I stepped off a curve or I fell down on something. No, it's much more insidious than that. It's, oh, I stepped funny getting out of my bed and I thought I had a stone bruise. Or I was walking, you know, we went to Disney World and, and I came back and I thought I had a stone bruise on my heel. And, you know, you get up in the morning out of bed, but you walk it off and it goes away. Ah, you can walk it off. And so that's how it starts. But if you don't do anything to get it better or you're not one of the lucky ones where it does happen to settle down on its own, then it becomes a chronic problem all you of a know sudden it hurts to walk it hurts to walk that and gets then, your attention and you would think that it would get more people's attentions but i have patients coming in well i've had this for three years like why did you wait so right, long right, right, right we could have helped you you didn't have to suffer like that I see this with you tumors know? all over the body you know, you know yeah. we didn't you know, we're you here notice? to help you did Come you me. notice this thing on your face you know yeah, yeah we want to help you and, it, and it, honestly the faster you get it treated you know the faster you're going to get better in doing the things that you want to do because if if your feet hurt and you can't walk for exercise and then you're not walking the dog or right. you can't stand to cook a meal uh, you know your patience is thin you know you don't want to play with your kids because your feet hurt you know or you can't do your grocery shopping it can really affect you changes everything mm -hmm. so underappreciated how? foundations yeah Tell yes <laughs> right so how do you how do you treat plantar fasciitis so, well, there's lots of treatments available for it. And the good news is, is that most people can get well without doing all them advanced therapies, things ah, like, things like surgeries and other modalities that we, the tools so, we've got so, in our so box. So the person with this diagnosis needn't be afraid, oh my goodness, I need surgery or something horrible or expensive Not at or first, painful. no. So where do you, where no. do you start? Where do we start? We start out by making sure that, um, the mechanics improve. Okay. And that's done with two things. One is making sure that you've got the right kind of support. Okay. So no barefoot. Ah, so, so good shoe, good orthotic. So good shoe, good orthotic if you need it. Okay. So not everybody needs them, but I find that many people get some benefit from it and there's a wide variety of options for, for orthotics. Um, and that's where you're, your podiatrist, your friend, yeah. and your friend Lance can come Lance, in and, yeah, and help with that. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. yes. And, and he has mm -hmm. these stories too of people so grateful because now they can walk. Because now they can yeah. walk for something simple. And also flexibility plays a role. Flexibility in how tight your Achilles is, how tight your hamstrings are. That was so... So one of the other things I was asking, you know, where's the foot end? Well, it connects to the ankle and a lot of mm -hmm. times your foot and it's ankle all doctors. Connected. And yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So how does one, let's say I, I suspect I've got a little, little pain getting in the morning, first couple steps. Is there any flexibility I, I, I can do to try mm -hmm. and nip it in the bud? I'd start out by some Achilles stretches. Okay. Um, you know, there's simple stretches that you can do against a wall um, where you put your heel back. Uh -huh. And you just kind of lean and stretch your old runner stretch. Yeah, yeah and, and just and just bend that ankle. It, mm -hmm. that, that's, just bend that ankle a little bit. It's and called anti-flexion, <laughs> but it seems like it's a dorsiflexion. Dorsiflexion is a is, dorsiflexion. is the foot term. Dorsiflexion. It's really an extension, but it's a dorsiflexion. I know it's really confusing, and it takes a while to get a. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <I laughs> when you're in that. school, yeah. to wrap your head around that. Wait a minute. So lean up. You got your foot flat. You lean against mm -hmm. the wall, and you bend. Get a mm -hmm. nice good stretch going. Yep. Or you use one of those like they have at the gym. They have those the triangles. Thing. Incline yeah. stretch, yep. Just, Take one of these, uh -huh. stick it in the fridge, roll your foot on it, get a good massage on that uh -huh. fascia. Your fascia, you like your palmar fascia, you have a plantar fascia. That's okay. that ligament that makes up your arch. It holds everything up. Okay. Underneath all those intrinsic muscles and those bones and those joints. And, and it's broad. It stretches from here all the way to where it inserts on the heel. And so you want to massage that whole thing. And then the ice is an anti-inflammatory. And anti-inflammatories can be helpful. 
you know, over the counter ones if you can tolerate them. So you make your own ice roller essentially. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's the cheapest one you're going to find is doing that or putting a can of peas in the refrigerator, getting that modality of the cold and the massage at the same time. You avoid your barefoot, you know, shoes, you know, we, we brought, we, we're going to bring up shoes again, you know, um, a lot of times we wear shoes past their prime, you know, or where oh, their I usefulness yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we all Poverty we all do mentality. Well, I got another year left. I got in another, these. and yeah. you know what, too? And then we, <laughs> and then when we need the support the most, like when we're out mowing the lawn, we use our lawn mowing shoes, which are yeah, the, the old the crap, shoes right, the old that are crappy. Old, and that's yeah, yeah, actually yeah. when you need the support the, the most. most. You know, um, 500 miles. And I am guilty of this also. I am the first to admit, like my running shoes, I I just, I didn't have time to go. And I went to Fleet Feet. I don't mind mentioning Jaeger's business. This is, that's just fine with me. Um, They do a very good job as far as analysis goes for, you know, what you mentioned earlier, you know, different shoe companies do different things with their shoes and so there's not one good one for right. everybody right. you know and even one brand may have models you may not be able to wear and mm-hmm. models that you can wear quite comfortably and so you yeah. know to some degree you're paying for that you know when you go to a store like fleet feet or dryers or american shoe so or, a real or uh, try yeah or try athletics right. any of those places in town you know where they have where they actually do a fitting and somebody with some knowledge of shoes and mechanics can can look at you but i've done it i've gone in and been like they're like when was the last time about the shoes i'm like here they're like how much do you walk and i told them and he just gave me a look i'm like don't so, at yeah. me okay <laughs> 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 just give me the shoes. I know what and I need. And it was, the garbage in. And on, I mean, and you know, two days oh, later, mysteriously, all my pain went away. I'm like, oh, wow, doc. Good so job. <laughs> proper, proper fitting sounds like a good investment. It is. Yeah. It is. If you can afford that. So moving on, what are other common conditions that you'll see in a day? So, well, there's my current day and then the things that, I saw before. So if we're talking general population, we see a lot of things like bunions, hammer toes, foot deformity. What is a bunion and what is a hammer toe? I got them on my whiteboard here. They were coming up. So bunions and hammer toes, they're basically, they're, they're, uh, they're deformities of the, of the toes. Your hammer toes, um, happen when your toes start to curl. Okay. Like that. And they can curl at any joint. So sometimes they curl at just one. Sometimes they curl at other ones. Sometimes oh, they sublux, so they look like that. a little hammer. Oh, that's the hammer. Yeah, mm-hmm. there will be one little one stuck in there. Yes, Weird. like that. Yeah. You know, and sometimes they go side to side. Kind of funny things. shape, yeah. Mm-hmm. Is there anything you could do just to kind of push them back? Or do you, is that a surgery? Is that a podiatric surgery? To fix it, it's a surgery. Okay. Um, you know, our bones aren't malleable like we are when we're kids. And so um, you're trying to treat a... A skeletal problem sure you're not gonna you're not gonna splint that you'd have to be very diligent about splinting for hours and hours and days and days without end and that's not really practical for so you can you do this at an outpatient surgery yes you could fix it if you do a hammer toe and then how long are you babying that foot or do you have to wear a special cast yeah well I mean, it just kind of depends thing? on the it depends on the surgery and how involved the fix is because different operations you know if you have just a little flexible joint that's coming down that recovery is a lot faster than somebody who has you know a long bone here and things that are crossed over and you know they're requiring a lot of pinning and things those folks may spend you know four to eight weeks you know in a surgical shoe and not comfortable toes toes are also tricky they're the farthest body farthest body part away from the heart Uh uh-huh we are on them. Mm. And so we have gravity pulling things down. When you surgerize something right. or you injure something, there's a greater metabolic demand. And so that creates this cascade of inflammatory micro- markers and cytokines and things to help the body heal. And that all floods and that sits and that sends fluid and stuff down there. Mm. So toes take a long time to recover. Um, so, I mean, you can swell for some time after surgery and really, I mean, it's really, I tell folks, you know, you may be up and doing 
your things, you know, relatively quickly in a couple months, it's like, you know, you're, you're much more into the life that you knew before, but really to feel recovered uh -huh. and like, this is my foot. It takes, it can take a year. You know. Yeah, they told me my shoulder when they put it was mm -hmm. six weeks. No, it was a year. It's a, it's a year them. before you it's feel yourself. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, now six weeks after surgery, you probably felt a whole heck of a lot better than the first week. Um, but, you know, there's still, there's still recovery and remodeling that your body does. What, what's a bunion? I know it's a lumpy, bumpy thing, but what, 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 what is a bunion? You tend to be prone to lumps and bumps and things. A bunion yeah. is when that first metatarsal, that's... It would really be here okay. on, the, on the hand directs out this way okay and the toe there's a little adductor hallucis muscle that holds the toe over ah. this way and so you get a it's not that you have a growth although some people have a growth there too but the, the bones bend. actually shift yeah and, and so that's, that's why you can't just cut it off there are some cases where you can do that or some cases where we might choose to do that because that's in the best interest of that particular patient okay. but usually requires some sort of an osteotomy is what we call it when we break the bone and move it over into a corrected position and then you have to do something to hold that in place and that's where the pins and stuff and that's come where in. pins or plates it's really kind of preference of the surgeon and also depends on the operation that they're doing so it's a malalignment in the, in mm -hmm. the joint and then you just put it back where it goes back where it goes yeah so what causes that i, I always thought that high heels and hammer toes well. high heel shoes <laughs> or is that just the shoes play their layman's. role no shoes play their role what i tell what i tell patients is for bunions hammer toes things like that it's not really an if for you it's a when because there's a disposition to it. Okay. Okay, and it's a genetic disposition. And also how your foot is structured may dispose you to having those things. Um, and that's through no fault of your own. That said, the things that you do, the environment that your foot is in can hasten that along. Mm -hmm. It can worsen the clinical symptoms or not. You know, so if you have a tendency a familial tendency to have a bunion and you are constantly walking in an unsupportive high heeled shoe, right. you know, you will develop problems a lot sooner than somebody that maybe they had that tendency, but they made shoe choices that were smart for their foot um, and had the right kind of support and, and didn't constrict their foot and maybe didn't spend as much time on their foot. Then those folks may not have problems until later. And even if they do, maybe it won't be bad enough where they are, coming in asking to have it repaired. Right, people don't, may not appreciate, but as a surgeon, I can tell you some people have what we call good protoplasm. Their skin is stronger. It mm -hmm. holds the stitch better. Their support ligaments. And it's not just mm -hmm. a... You know, there, there, there's famous, you know, genetic problems, Ehlers-Danlos yeah. Syndrome, yeah. where they're their college, they have a mm -hmm. genetic defect in their collagen. And then but there's some, PPP. How we refer to it. <laughs> yeah, poor protoplasm. Yeah. Piss poor Piss protoplasm. Poor protoplasm yes. Yeah, and people just have weaker weaker tissues and mm -hmm. whatnot. I guess their feet will break down easier. Yeah. They do. There is there There's is that also. Genetics are probably know. a little nutrition involved. And involved in it. Chronic yeah. nutritional issues. You know, you know, there's a lot of factors that you don't control. Right. You know, we're really quick to kind of maybe blame the patient or 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 blame ourselves for, oh, you know, you could have done this or you should have been doing that. Right. Maybe, maybe, you know, there, you know, and, and I would encourage you not to, to, to not choose to not do those things. You want right. to do those things that are going to maximize your, your, your health and your, and your risk. But sometimes things are just unlucky. Yeah, that know? happens. That happens. So what are some other conditions you might treat? It may not be the top two or three, but what are some mm -hmm. other things you treat? So, um, some nerve pain, we treat nerve pain. Well, tell you, we had a, a, a pain specialist here who does uh, nerve blocks mm -hmm. and whatnot in a recent, uh, podcast. So tell me about nerve pain of the feet. So, well, it can be different causes. Sometimes nerve pain is in the foot and sometimes it doesn't originate in the foot. And if it doesn't originate in the foot, then there's not a lot that a podiatrist can do for that. 
But you, but you need to be able to differentiate. But you the need two. to be able to figure so it out. So you're not treating something mm-hmm. that's 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 in a different place. That's correct. Yeah, and ah. sometimes it's difficult to sort that out. I bet. To be honest, you know, that's nerves are is. tricky. Uh-huh. Nerves are tricky. So you, there are some nerve conditions that we see. The most common one being a neuroma. Neuroma is a bit of a misnomer because it's not really a tumor. It's a nerve that kind of grows and enlarges in between your metatarsals, and so folks will come in with a very specific set of symptoms. And it's more common than you would think, but they'll have burning or tingling mm. in between, you know, they'll feel like they're walking on a wadded up sock. Can you, can you feel an aroma when you examine it? You can, it? If, the, if it's large enough, you know, sometimes with a, with a young or not super inflamed aroma, you may not be able to elicit that, but yes, you can feel an aroma if it is large enough to do it. So how can you treat an aroma? So, well, first thing is getting pressure off that spot. And that's, Uh, and that's sometimes it's simple as using something called a metatarsal pad or metatarsal bar where it's some uh, padding placed in the sole of the shoe or on an orthotic. mm -hmm. It's easier to do it on an orthotic because then you can move it around from shoe to shoe. Um, You know, but you can also put it, you can put it directly on your foot if you wish, but then you've got to do that all the time or you can lay that. Know, on the inlay of the shoe that's that extra little arch they put right that's in a here. little itsy bitsy that thing itsy yeah bitsy arch that they mm-hmm. put in my that's that extra bit yeah that's what that's for it's to relieve and, four foot pressure yeah. and is that opening up the bones that's just a little yeah it kind of opens it up so it takes pressure off that nerve and sometimes that's enough to let that and settle down enough. sometimes if that doesn't help you can put a cortisone injection in there so you could do that mm-hmm. and you'd probably get relief pretty quickly. 50-50 with cortisone. I wish that I could say that it is a magic bullet every time. It's not for some You add some, bu- some canes and bupivacate I and typically lidocaine. add some canes in there. Put a I cane do, in yeah. there, yeah. That, well, a part of it is because when you inject a nerve, it can be fairly painful. And so the to put an anesthetic in there is sure. is nice because then you kind of get over that first... 24 hours of discomfort from that injection and then most folks as that wears off then you know it's just a matter of letting that steroid do its job gotcha you have a nerve any other nerve pains of the foot now is that different from diabetic neuropathy a morton's neuroma is very different from a diabetic neuropathy so you um, so you, it, it's a morton's neuroma morton's neuroma is like, okay i don't know if maybe it was morton that described that probably that'd be my guess yeah hopefully so- morton didn't have it yeah, right. <laughs> That's the only way you get named at named something is either you find it or you have it, and you for sure don't want to be the latter. Well, tell you what, I don't want to pull. Di- I want to talk about diabetes as a as a as, as a bigger topic. But what what other foot conditions might you see <clears throat> in a day? So then you see your other things like you know your other like I don't want to say major, but, but you know like a flat foot or a. Tell me, about flat feet. Feet. Yeah, know, you, tell me about flat feet. I told you. Tell me, please. Tell me about flat feet. Are you born with them, or do you get them from bad shoes and tough, tough work? Uh, you know, you know, requirements or something. That yes, you know, nature, for, <laughs> nature, nurture, and both. Both. You can you can get both. Some people are born with them, and and having a flat foot in and of itself isn't necessarily a problem. Having a symptomatic flat foot is a problem. Okay. Okay, but just because somebody has a flat foot, if it's not causing them problems with function and or pain, so what? You know, if you find shoes that fit and you're comfortable and you're doing your things, you don't touch that. It's just a natural variant. It's just a variant, yep. Okay. It's a spectrum. All right. So if you think of think of feet, you can have a flat as a pancake on one end right. and you can have a high arch foot that you could shoot a bullet through the hole between wow. the toes and the and the heel. Now, is that they equally bad too? Can you have too much arch? Oh yeah, you can. Ah. And it can and we see that I mean some of it's hereditary and some of it we see with neurological conditions. Um there's one particular Charcot Marie tooth. Um oh, is a hereditary. You remember that one? Remember that one? Yeah. yeah, it's a hereditary sensory motor neuropathy. Um and it leaves you with a very much claw type foot and and it can be painful it doesn't move very well or hold you up very well and then you also run the risk of breaking down and getting sores on your feet too oh, there's too much pressure because the, there's too much pressure spots. on the okay. hot spots yeah okay. and those hot spots can be a problem so a symptomatic flat foot 
then I'm probably treating it right by wearing my prescription orthotics. That's, yeah, that, the yeah arch that would and, be a start. And, and I mean, is it, uh, you know, is it, you know, a kid came out and, you know, are they having trouble running and functioning? You might treat that child differently than you may treat an adult that, you know, sometimes, you know, it's a matter of my arches fell over time. You know, because that, that, that they can and they can. Yeah. And and most of us lose our arch as we get older, just because uh, we have weight changes. Our joints may become lax or more arthritic. We get pregnant. Talking, we get pregnant. Yeah. 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 So those things happen. Um, but you can also have an injury or where a tendon will tear, you know, and you will lose your arch. And that thing, typically you have to. Um, can you put that back those. together? You can. You put can fix that. Together. I, I personally don't do that procedure, but yes, yes, there it are can podiatrists be done. that can One can, can be do done. that. Mm -hmm. Yes, they can be done. And you would want to have that done if it gets to that point. Gotcha. Um, and, and it's not always as simple as just repairing the tendon. It's, it a lot of times will also involve some other um, work to the, to the bones and the joints to make sure that it stays in that place. So those kinds of reconstructions are, are fairly major operations not major in the sense that they take a long time um, and they can be complicated because if they're done wrong you know you have consequences of that you know where you may not function very well afterwards and also that amount of work takes a long time to heal so it's really I mean, you're really going to feel a year of healing with something wow. like that so so let's talk about some of the maybe less common things maybe the in medicine we call them zebras and where does that come from it comes from you're, you're taught in, in, in school that common things are common. Mm -hmm. And when you hear right. hoofbeats, you hear hoofbeats, you, you should you think hear it, horses. It's all, it, better, it better be a horse. And then all of a sudden it comes around the bend, there's the zebra. There's zebra so, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's, so that's where the term zebra comes from. And first. zebras aren't very common. And, some, and you don't want to be looking for zebras all the time because most of the time they are horses. Right. But you want to be aware that there are zebras because sometimes you do see some zebras and you, it just kind of blows your mind. Um, the, the zebra that I see the most, um, two zebras really. One zebra that I see is um, uh, things like a syndactyly. Where you <laughs> is that an extra toe? Is that an extra toe? <laughs> well, the extra well, you can right? you, no, no. you can have kind of well. There's all kinds of dactyls. You can have supernumerary digits. Okay. Which I have a good case about that one. That one was a that one was a zebra that I saw. Um, you can have um, macrodactyly where you have one very large digit. You have microdactyls where you have little bitty digits. You can have short. This one's really common. On the fourth, actually, you would see that more than you would think. The fourth metatarsal sometimes will be congenitally short, and so you'll have this toe ah. that's sitting down here, and all the rest of the toes are up here. I'll be damned. Um, that's a brachymetatarsia. So brachymetatarsia. You, mm -hmm. you see the syndactyly is the fused toes. That's what syndactyly. Mm -hmm. I see that it will be in between these toes. It's, usually, it's a lot of times the second and the third. I have a little bit of syndactyly on my second and third. Because it Except can happen in degrees, yep. Uh -huh. right. It can happen in degrees. Some people just, I just have it a little bit. So it yes, looks a little bit meets different. together, yeah, it meets together toes. Um, but some people have them completely fused. And I see a couple of those a year, huh. you know, where I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. And, you know, the, you know, maybe elderlies, but, you know, it's, it's not a surprise. And if it's not painful, then, you know, you, you kind of leave it. Because you can, you know, in children, you can... Take you them can apart. Them. You can separate them. There have been times that I have actually syndactylized digits, where I have put them together on purpose. Kind of like a um, like what is it? Going a buddy splint? Kind of like a permanent buddy splint. Um, oh. And I've and I've done that. You, typically, that's done on the fourth and fifth toes. If somebody has a very painful interdigital corn, which is basically like a callus that forms on the on the foot, you know, um, but we call them oh. corns when they happen on their toes. And that's okay. like an old English corn was like something hard or whatever. And that's where that term comes from. Lots of old terms. <laughs> Not that extent. old cartoon that you see of the witch at Halloween time. You know, where does candy corn come from? And the witch has little candy corn sprouting and she's clipping them off into the thing. It's the like, one that I love to hate the most is piles. We'll yes. just leave that alone. <laughs> Talk about old expressions. 
<laughs> so you've got the buddy. Oh my gosh, pile. <laughs> old, 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 old medicine. So I have I have done that on purpose where really it made more sense to just put a part of that toe together so it doesn't move anymore and they don't have that irritation there. It is a technically difficult procedure. It is a pain in the butt to do that procedure because you're working uh -huh. in a very small space. You've taken uh -huh. out skin. You're trying to put it together um, and then trying to get this last stitch in here when you're trying oh, to keep boy. the toes together is a is a challenge um so yeah it's a technically unfun procedure so um, tell me some other uh, other zebra le less common conditions so the you less might common treat. ones that we might treat and, and and i say treat really treat may not be the right word for it because we we I, we evaluate it and then we go and send them off is cancer ah uh, you can get cancers of your foot mm -hmm. you can you can't, and I probably see one to two a year. Now, is this of the skin or the bones? Most of them are the skin. skin. Most of them so are the skin, but they but they happen where you can have them in bones. You can have it's, them. It's in the, called a sarcoma, right? It, um, it depends on what it is. I mean, you can have uh, osteosarcoma that happens in the bones. Okay. You know, sometimes you can find benign tumors like an enchondroma. You know, ah. which um, is is actually fairly you know, common, those little enchondromas, um, you know, you can sometimes get some tumors in the, in the heel bone. Most of them are benign, um, but you kind of need to, you know, pay attention to those things. And so if there's you know, a lump in your foot and it's not going and it's away, not, it's not going away. It's probably worth getting it looked at nine times out of 10, 99 times out of a hundred. It's something that we can look at and explain right away. We might choose to get a test just to mm. make sure. Um, but it's, probably going to be benign. There are the times when they're not though. Um, the majority that I see are skin. Um, and they're usually somebody that's coming in. Um, and they may be treating something that they thought it was like a wart or, you know, an ulcer or a sore and maybe had all the right treatments for that, but it just isn't getting better, yeah. you know? And then I see folks that we see with pigmented lesions. You can get um, melanomas mm -hmm. under oh, the yeah. under the nails, right? Well, you can get them anywhere. I mean, you can get them anywhere. And that is a life threatening. That is cancer. a life threatening cancer. That will, yeah, that is your, yeah, yeah. That's a really serious thing, and it will, you know, sometimes, you know, when folks have, we were talking about hammer toes earlier, and you know, the folks will, um, you know, maybe get bruised or whatever underneath their their toes, especially elderly patients that have really rigid toes and they're constantly walking off of them. They may uh -huh. get kind of horns or bruising underneath there, but I've seen it where I'm like, this isn't right. When you do things for a long time, you've probably read Gladwell or, you know, so Malcolm, yeah, yeah. 10,000 hours. Yeah. <laughs> and, Malcolm, and just, yeah. you know, and, and you know, you're thinking, you know, you see things and you have that, um, you know, that something is wrong, but you may not know what it is, but you've seen enough normal to know that this is not yeah, you get it. And you right get here. that, yeah, and you get that kind of, right. kind of, kind of chest sensation and the hair stand up on the back of your, yep. your neck, you know, you mm -hmm. see those things and you're like, Ooh, we got a problem here. So those, uh, you know, those I would usually send off to somebody that does skin cancer. Um, in my current situation, I walk up to the derm clinic and I said, come with me. And usually I get a grab. A, I like that. Yeah. It's a, Oh, why are you bothering us with this? But sad, they know, but sad they know, they know it's a bad I'm one. coming to get them they that they, that one. this is something that they need to see right away, you know, and they, and they can be, be bad, you know, and you start taking the history and learning a little bit more. The patient's yeah. lost 30 pounds in the last six months. Yeah. And you're like, it just gets signs. worse and worse. Yeah. And, and, you know, then, you know, so that it happens, it happens. So you got to kind of, Kind of watch for that and the scariest one is the amelanotic melanomas that means not pigment that means no that they're means pale the, the normal clues aren't there yeah. and that when you have to have a real high index of suspicion you know where you're yep. like i a, don't know what this is well, we but i don't like it and this is making me really really nervous so and if That's i'm right. getting nervous then I'm a nervous person in general, <laughs> but if my hair is standing on end, someone else is going to share that wealth and, and help you out. And, and it's one of those things that I don't like to see, but we see sometimes. And I'm going to make a plug. That's why doctors are so important. You 
you, you have a mid-level person or a nurse practitioner who knows a lot of stuff but hasn't seen the thousands of feet all the things. and seen the zebras, they're going to miss the zebras. And you can see it can be really devastating, you know, devastating, it's devastating consequence. huge consequences. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and so people, they don't, happen. people don't realize that they measure these, gro these gross or these large numbers in public health. They say, "Oh, look, the care is the same." Yeah, you're you're, you're not. You're, you're, what you're looking at isn't powerful enough to see that one percent. Mm -hmm. That would only be found. And it by matters a doctor. with that one percent to that patient. That's a hundred. Oh yeah, that's a hundred percent to that patient. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So I do. I see a couple of those a year, which also makes me a, ner a little bit nervous. I'm like, do I? Am I missing? Right. More, you know, so so right. that index of suspicion is there. You have in general, I think, you know, the longer you do things and the longer you look at what's normal or what's what's common for X, Y or Z condition, you know, you get a pretty good sense of right away looking at something and being I've, I've mm -hmm. kind of got 70 or 80 percent of it right there. But does right. it mean that, mm -hmm. you know, and you have to be forthcoming with the patient. This is probably this. If you see these warning signs, you need to let us know so we can, we can change the treatment. Gotcha. So I have left a, a few things I still want to talk about, but a huge topic is diabetes oh, yeah. and feet. Now, I've been holding that one to the end, <laughs> well, to nearer the end. So diabetes, let's, let's go over diabetes. Diabetes means that blood sugars are high. And high blood sugars can damage the body, damages nerves, dam probably damages blood vessels worse than the damage to the blood vessels damages the nerves, because it, 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 we can go into the physiology of that. I'm not an expert, but so you've got these abnormally high sugars, essentially poisoning the body Poison. over time, creating damage to the nerves, so that most people would understand that the nerves, be, the feet and extremities become numb. The, the nerves are actually damaged to a point where they don't feel. Now they can get overly sensitive, I believe. Mm -hmm. Things things called dysthesias. Yeah, the paresthesias. So, yeah. Paresthesias. Mm -hmm. And you already have a foot which doesn't have very good blood supply. It's already not. And now you've got the blood vessels uh filling up with, with plaque and, and blockages and whatnot. And another thing I, I didn't say, I'll just get, get a little grody on you here. Remember that amputation I was mm -hmm. telling you about? It didn't bleed didn't bleed because the arteries were filled with stuff that looked like toothpaste. That's one of your worst nightmares, honestly, yeah, in the operating room bleed. where you're like, this isn't bleeding. This isn't We've got bleeding. big problems. Yeah, Houston, yeah. we got a problem. So, so, so now that I've kind of, for, for the general audience, kind of set up, you know, what is diabetes and where's the damage, how does that affect the feet? So really, with, so folks, when they have diabetes, it's almost like you have a case of termites in your foundation. The damage plan. that's I done. Yeah, like I know. Now, I like this. I can remember this kind <laughs> of stuff. But that's the thing. If you know something well enough to explain it to a five-year-old, then you mm -hmm. can, then that understanding goes and it's carried everywhere. I'm finding this very valuable. <laughs> I'm, I'm learning so much. So termites of the feet, what do they do? So, so, so when you think you've got termites, okay, they go in, they're quiet. You don't hear them. They don't do anything. But inside, they're wrecking havoc on your foundation all the wood on the inside of your house and it's not until you see these little signs these little the occasional black wing insect or the little nest that's coming out they're like oh crap i've got termites but your foundation and all your structures have been damaged incredibly and it's a costly repair well diabetes is like that because it eats away at your body silently there's no warning unlike an appendix you know, your appendix goes bad. You feel like crap. Right. You know, you get a fever. You're sick to your stomach. You've got intense pain. You get that taken care of right away because it's a bother. Diabetes you. is silent. It's quiet. It's insidious. It just goes in and it destroys things over time, subtly, without you being aware of it. Your body ignores it. And so with the nerves, it destroys that coating on that nerve. You know, if you've got your nerves, your peripheral nerves, it's like your cord from this lamp or this microphone, right, you know. So around there's insulation it. around there. There's a myelin the sheath. Myelin. There's that myelin sheath. And inside there's that neuron that's like your copper wire, okay? okay. And, and, and that has to be intact for the connection to function the way it's supposed to. If you took your pocket knife and started stripping away that coating, well, uh, lo and behold, now you've got these 
misfires or it doesn't fire when you need it to. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the nerve works the same way. That myelin sheath gets eroded or destroyed from that sugar, however that is. If it's thinned, right. if it's if there's a hole that's been eaten out of it, now that connection to the brain, the brain will do its best to interpret whatever signal the nerve is giving it. The problem is it's no longer an accurate si uh, signal. You can't, you can't trust it anymore, and that's really hard to wrap your head around. You function on an everyday basis with assumptions. You make assumptions that my body is working correctly. My body is digesting the food that it's supposed to. My body is creating waste yeah. and filtering things the way it needs to. And I don't need to worry about it until it's time to go to the bathroom. You know, when my body needs nutrition or thirst, I'm going to feel it and I will know. You know, right. I take for granted that I'm going to hear something or see something or that this functions it's normally. It's all autonomic. And now it's... That's right, and that's what gets destroyed. And so now you don't know. You don't have any feeling in your foot. You don't know that you don't have any feeling in your foot. And you've stepped, and in, you've hot stepped water in hot water or, 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 or hot thorn. sand at the beach. Uh, or, it can get hot all right. Or you were walking around in your driveway in your shoes maybe and gravel got in there in your shoe and you walked around on it for a week or walked around on your money clip. Oh, was that you've seen? Or the bullet. Like you've seen these things. Those are all things that I've pulled out of patient's shoes or out of their person. The paper and clip, the wire, and they have no idea. Oh, that's horrifying. It is horrifying. And it's and and you know, you, you tell folks you're like, I know you don't believe me because you can't feel it and you don't you don't understand that until the day happens when you've hurt yourself, you know. And there's not a week that goes by that something isn't coming out of the foot. That didn't belong there mm -hmm. yeah oh my goodness like emergency rooms have things they pull out of people's rectums and yeah ours and, isn't and that cool. sometimes have... it's that smelly but it's not usually that cool right right but you but mine I... it's like i said paper clips and... thorns pieces of wood hair you'd be surprised at how animal hair can bury itself in there glass oh. the glass that broke two weeks ago and you missed that one little spot and it's been in there the whole time and you have, and suddenly my foot hurts and you look down and it's red and hot and swollen. There's pus coming out. And now we have a surgical emergency. And you can lose. And you can lose it yeah. because diabetes wrecked your circulation and it wrecked your nerves. And now you're in a very precarious spot. Boy, oh boy. So obviously other than getting your diabetes under control, sounds like managing your foot with I guess intense surveillance. That's exactly right. And the, I mean, and the things that we tell diabetics are just good habits to get into in general. Do a foot inspection every day. You know, if you can't reach to see the bottom, put a hand mirror on the floor. Take a peek. You're looking for anything that doesn't belong there. And nothing is too silly. You know, if you think you have a problem, diabetic or not, come see us. Come see us because we can help you, even if it's just the reassurance that, no, you don't have to worry about this. Don't, you know, you don't have to think about it over the weekend, you know, or maybe it is something and early intervention yeah. means a better outcome for you, right. you know, so, right. so I mean, that matters, you know, yeah. you know, good skin hygiene, you know, we talked about the skin being this organ, right. it keeps things out, it keeps things in, but it also helps us communicate and helps us do things, but that barrier needs to be intact. So right. moisturizing it if it's dry, treating the skin conditions that come up. Yeah, and you I know. wear um, these double layer polypro. Thanks to my friend Lance, by the way. God, I'm <laughs> plugging him all the time here. These double layer polypropylene socks. They slip. I wear them when I'm mm -hmm. when I used to mountain climb, right. and hiking mm -hmm. boots. They, they they prevent the blisters. The blisters, and right? Because a blister can be, you know, in a sensate person. They're, they're painful and create a problem, right. but that sensate person is also going to address it because it hurts. Right, 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 right. And then the proper shoe and support, proper fitting mm -hmm. and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah, proper shoe fitting is key, you know, because you have all those hot spots that we talked about earlier, the tips of the toes, the heels, the metatarsal heads, you mm -hmm. know, those are spots for breakdown potentially. And that's where shoe gear becomes important. If you're not wearing a good shoe, you know, you're going to run into troubles, you know, and it's, if you have a rub and it rubs a sore, that's huge. It takes diabetic foot ulcers months to heal in the very best case scenario, meaning that every little detail was attended to and the patient 
was able to adhere to everything that we did. Fully they could do ex- fully compliant, best care in the world and still may take a long time and still might be unlucky, you know, but you know, you add in the things that you're, that, that you have more problems, you know, adhering to, um, maybe on purpose, maybe not on purpose. I can't because, remember to take a vitamin every day. I, I mean, not that I'm a big, but there's a particular exactly. vitamin I'm so, supposed to so, take. So, right, exactly. It's the same thing. But like a girl would say, how could you forget your birth control pill? Well, it's quite easy. Yeah, it, it it's happens. It's quite yeah. easy. And so, I mean, you know, you want to make sure you give that, you know, patient their grace because, you know, life is life is hard and there's yeah. a lot of things, but some risk management is also important, you know. Boy, now are there any, you've done such wonderful preparation for this, Marianne. Are there any other topics that we did not cover that you think we should bring up here for our audience? Um. I guess a couple of things. One, if you're diabetic or you have circulation complications or, you know, you're having some nerve issues or think you might have them, you know, don't wait. Go and see. A, go and see a podiatrist. Go see yeah. a professional. Please get a get an evaluation so they can honestly assess your risk and, you know, figure out ways to kind of keep your feet healthy and keep you walking because we want to see you able in doing things and have a good quality of life. And really that goes for everyone. You know, that ounce of prevention really is worth a pound of cure, you know, yeah. doing the good foot hygiene. Um, you know, if something's not healing, come see us, mm. you know, you've tried your over the counter remedies. You've tried what, you know, your coworker had suggested for things. You're not getting better. You know, don't wait, you know, come in and see us. Um, yeah. Um, I'm going to ask you one, something very controversial. I, I always throw in it. Mm. I'm like, was it Kojak or was it Columbo? It was it Columbo that would come in? The, he, he, the killer would think mm-hmm. that they got off and then was, was mm-hmm. it Columbo or Kojak? I think it was Kojak. Col- Kojak. Maybe. I don't know. Those, those, one of those it's been 70s, a long time. One of those since 70s detectives, right? With Peter Falk. And it, he'd be walking and the killer would think they got off. Then he'd come and he'd go, one last the thing. thing. <laughs> that, 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 that was Columbo. Yeah. <laughs> Columbo. We have podiatrists who are, you know, the ones that do it are, are, are professional, well trained foot and ankle surgeons. Mm-hmm. And you have MD orthopedic surgeons that have foot and ankle expertise. Mm-hmm. When would you choose one over the other? What, who's going to be better for what in general terms? Now, obviously, it comes down to the surgeon. That uh, would be the, the first indi- thing is that, you you know, you could have a good podiatric surgeon. You could have a good orthopedic surgeon. Okay. Um, and so some of it is going to be, you know, surgeon. Um, in terms of, of, you know, a foot and ankle orthopedic surgeon, they want to do surgery. That's what they're treating. Right. Okay. Um, And so you probably, if you're going to go like just for, you know, diabetic foot care and things like that, you really want to see a podiatrist. Right. Because that's in their wheelhouse. You know, that is in their, in their wheelhouse. There is a lot of overlap between what foot and ankle orthopedic surgeons do and podiatric surgeons do. Not every podiatric surgeon is going to do everything that a foot and ankle orthopedic surgeon will do and vice versa, you know, and they may have different approaches. Right. And I assume um, like the big joint work. I know there's artificial joints and mm-hmm. stuff and which, which, ankle fusions. Which podiatrists and stuff. do. It, like I said, it depends on the area. If your area doesn't have, you know, either one of those, then, you know, you're kind of at the mercy of whoever is, is right. close to you. Here we have both. So it's yeah. true like with anything in medicine. You don't be afraid to get second, second opinions. opinions. That's right. And anyone worth their salt will not be worried about you going to see a second opinion. Yes. And if you're going to have a major operation like that, it's not going to hurt to have another set of eyes to look at you. Yeah, you know? I, I, I do make one stipulation because I, I encourage people to get second opinions, but I encourage you not to get a second opinion from an idiot because it <laughs> makes it worse. It makes it worse. It, and in fact, I have trusted colleagues that I would send people to it. I ask people, I'm not going to send you to somebody who's going to rubber stamp what I'm saying, but there's right. people I trust mm-hmm. for a good second opinion. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. There are some folks that I would opinion, be, is, oh, not, is not worth it. Yes. Because then we got to dig out that hole and then try mm-hmm. to get a, a And I would also, don't opinion. get your second or third opinions from Dr. Google either. Yeah. You don't know what you don't know. 
you know, and so while I think, you know, the internet can be a useful tool, sure. sometimes we don't know where we're getting that information. So what I tell patients, make sure you check with a healthcare professional that you trust when you're getting medical information on the internet, you know, yeah. and also go to a source of information that is a trustworthy rubber stamp source, yeah. Yeah. whether that is APMA, you know, American College of Reproductive Endocrinologists, whoever that is, you know, Mayo right. Clinic, you know, your hospital website, right. those kinds of places, as opposed to the YouTube video of Joe Schmo doing a, right. a, a video of you know, nail treatment. Nail treatment, yeah. Right, I got you. Yeah, I'm, I tell people, read all you want. Just don't mm -hmm. believe everything until you check with us. That's right. Yep. That's right, good. Well, Marianne, what a, what a, educational discussion uh, we've had i have learned a ton well thank you for having me i wasn't uh, sure that i would be able to teach you anything oh uh, you've taught me a <laughs> bunch and you've confirmed what i already know you're a fantastic physician wonderful health care provider and i think columbia and especially our vets at truman va are just just so lucky to have you so well thank you you're a wonderful resource and what a pleasure to have you as a colleague and as a friend thank you thank yes. you for coming today appreciate it pleasure thank you